Hey guys, uh, this screencast is on nuclear power, but we're going to be looking at the consequences. Uh, recall last time we described nuclear power and its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one of those disadvantages included the fact that it has an extremely low uh, net energy yield, right? And, and contributing to that low net energy yield is the fact that nuclear power produces a lot of waste, uh, radioactive waste that needs to be stored properly and sometimes it needs to be stored for a very long time period and so ultimately this is going to require more energy and uh, lower the net energy yield even further um, quite possibly making it uh, a, a negative net energy yield alright so why is that well there are byproducts from the nuclear power industry and it produces low level radioactive waste as well as high level radioactive waste uh, obviously, low level refers to a low amount of radioactivity. In other words, these are usually the, um, the materials that have come in contact with the radioactive isotopes, right? So tools, clothing, things of that nature uh, typically have a short half-life. They're dangerous, but they remain dangerous for only a short time period. Uh, on the order of a hundred or, or a few hundred years. Um, so the storage requirements for low-level radioactive waste are, are m aren't as strict. Uh, they are typically stored on-site in barrels um, and after a hundred or so years they can be then uh, discarded in a, a landfill or a low-level radioactive waste hazardous waste, waste site. Um, High-level radioactive waste, on the other hand, it poses a, a bigger problem. Uh, this is material that has a very long half-life, and, and usually what we're talking about are the spent fuel rods, right? So this is going to remain dangerous for a very long time period, uh, usually a minimum of 10,000 years. That's going to be your golden value there, guys, uh, or on the order of 10 half-lives. So. There is um, very specific protocol uh, as to how we handle high-level radioactive waste. Um, typically, the radioactive control rods and the fuel itself last for about three to four years in the reactor core. And after that point in time, they have to remove it and then discard of it properly. So once they remove it from the core, they uh, give it a bath and they put it into a water-filled pool for about five years where it cools because it's piping hot. Um, it, absolutely amazing. And even after these five years in this pool, they still come out very, very hot um, and radioactive. But after five years of a nice ba bath, um, then they are stored on site in these specially designed <laughs> design dry casks or containers made of special metal alloy um, that sit on these reinforced concrete pads. Um, so they're stored on site in these dry casks. Um, and, and of course, this is cons a concern uh, of many because now they are sort of outside of the reactor core. Um, they're outside of that containment vessel and therefore they're exposed to potential terrorist threats. And that's alarming because many of these uh, dry cask facilities are located on rivers and lakes because we know that's where the nuclear power plants are typically located. And we know there's also a, a, good, a good concentration of people located close to these areas as well. Over 50% of America's population lives within 75 miles of one of these nuclear power plants. And we have over 104 nuclear power plant facilities across America. So that's problematic. And in terms of defense and protecting these areas, uh, it's tricky, right? Um, you know, and so the prevailing idea is that we need to start to consolidate our radioactive waste into one structure or facility so that we can defend it properly as opposed to having 104 of these sites spread out across the country. Um, 
And so the idea was uh, passed really in the, in the mid 1980s. And in 1987, they proposed a centralized repository 160 miles uh, west of the city of Las Vegas. And this was known as Yucca Mountain. Um, it's actually a prehistoric volcanic caldera uh, from the Jurassic time period. So this is sort of the rim of that ancient volcanic rim. Um, and what they wanted to do, and they actually began to hollow this out and, and to actually create a massive repository to store all of our radioactive, high-level radioactive waste in this one central location. Um, it seemed like a good idea in 1987, and they started to go through with it, spending billions and billions of dollars. They actually uh, got most of it done. Uh, here is sort of the entrance to where the radioactive material would be um, deposited. Um, but it, recently, uh, many scientists were starting to question the reliability of this site. Um, they were concerned, uh, many concerns. Uh, one concern is the fact that, wow, this is a seismically active place. Yeah, these are all earthquakes that have occurred in the area. So this is a, um, a seismically active area where um, plates are colliding and shifting and earthquakes are, are frequently occurring. And so these seismic shifts sort of um, pose a risk and a threat to this repository area. Um, because if there's any shifts and collapses um, with the radioactive material, this could uh, result in a, a pretty large explosion of radioactive material that could contaminate uh, a vast region. Um, so that is a concern. Uh, there's other concerns about the hydrology. You know, right now it's a fairly arid location, but remember this has to be stored for tens of thousands of years. So what happens if the uh, climate shifts slightly and you get more precipitation and the rock itself is not impervious. In other words, there's a lot of fissures and cracks where water could percolate through and then start to corrode the bins and the structures that the radioactive material is found in. And that radioactive material can enhance that corrosion through its high temperatures. So there's also concerns about the hydrology. Um, in addition to that, um, here is the centralized location. It gets to be tricky, right? Because we know we have 104 of these sites all over across uh, the United States. And how do we get that material there? Well, we get it there by truck or by train. Um, and so as we transport that material, um, we run the risk of accidents. Uh, accidents happen all the time with trucks. Accidents happen all the time with trains. Um, and, and so we're concerned about that as it passes through um, highly populated communities. Um, likewise, these are now sort of movable targets. Um, and, and so as we transport them, it, you know, certainly any terrorist could just simply uh, using some sort of um, you know, bazooka or something uh, could actually target one of these moving radioactive uh, targets, and, and that could be dangerous as well. In addition to the um, problems posed with the long-term storage of radioactive waste, uh, there is also concern of the risk of accidents, right? And, and while technologies have improved and safety measures have improved, uh, there is always the threat of accidents. You only have to think of the most recent event uh, in Japan following the subduction zone tsunami that um, affected the Fukushima plant and released uh, an abundance of radiation in the region. Uh, but of course, this was all initiated in the United States in 1979 with the Three Mile Island accident, um, which was a partial meltdown. Um, although very little radiation escaped, uh, it started to change the public opinion very quickly. Um, and as a result, no new nuclear power plants were constructed following the Three Mile Island incident in 1979. Um, several years later, of course, the, the biggie was Chernobyl in 1986 in the former Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, the nuclear power plant suffered from two simultaneous explosions 
uh, and total meltdowns of the reactor core, literally blowing the roof off uh, the entire building and spewing radioactive material throughout much of eastern, western Europe, and then eventually it was detected globally um, as, a, as a total radioactive cloud sort of resonated throughout um, the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and of course, this resulted in uh, high casualties. At least 56 people died shortly after, and the long-term death tolls are sort of unknown in terms of the increased rates of cancer, um, especially thyroid cancer, leukemia, um, immune system issues, and all sorts of mutations, right? Because this is ionizing radiation, and ionizing radiation has the ability to pluck off electrons from an atom. And if it can do that, you can imagine what it could do to uh, humans and, and to uh, human health at the cellular level as it starts to destroy tissue and cells. Um, and, and it can initiate all sorts of cancers and so forth. In fact, um, high-level radioactive waste, you know, even after 10 years, if you stood within a meter, a meter of it, um, you would be dead within three minutes. So there's a lot of radioactive ionizing radiation um, left over um, that can still be detected uh, around the area of Chernobyl and the soils and the water supplies um, that is of great concern. So that's it for today, guys, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.